We want to describe this chip here in Verilog. We're going to call our chip, the type of our chip, we're going to call it type Y. It's got three one-bit inputs and two one-bit outputs. And it's given by this truth table here. It's combinational logic fully described by the truth table here. In the olden days, we'd have to use sum of products form to try to work out an expression for D using logic gates and then do the same for E, work out a separate expression for E in terms of logic gates and implement the circuit that way. For greater efficiencies, you might use something like a Kana map, which we're not considering in this course. But these days, we just have to tell Verilog what, well, sorry, we just have to describe in Verilog what we want. We can describe this truth table here. And then a synthesis tool like Quartus is able to figure out how to build the combinational logic to implement this truth table here. The way we do it is we use a case statement, and we'll have a look at that now. Because a case statement is a one-off statement, it just gets executed once, what we need to do is surround it with some type of a loop. So we use an always for that. The way it always works is it's an infinite loop, but it waits for something to change. Remember, Verilog was designed for doing simulations, and if you're actually simulating this, it's very wasteful if you go around in a loop forever without waiting for something to change first, because you're not actually doing anything useful. So we want to wait for something to change when we simulate this circuit, and in this case, we want to wait until either A or B or C change, because that's the input to our chip. Only when one of these things changes do I need to do something. Now if you want to be, uh, if you want to future proof your code in case you add more things, you could have a begin and an end statement here. That will allow you to do more than one thing when A, B or C change. If we're trying to be efficient though, in terms of typing, then a case statement's considered just a single statement, hence we don't actually need the begin and end if we follow the always immediately with a case statement. With the case statement, there's one caveat here. I, I need to have just a single variable in here, yet my case is going to depend on three different variables, A, B, and C. And the way to create a single number out of three separate numbers is to use the concatenation operator, which is given by these curly brackets here. So in particular, I'm going to do case. And now I need a single thing here, a single register, a single wire. But I want to combine A, B, and C together. So these curly brackets mean that you take the individual one-bit numbers, A, B, and C, and you combine them together in that order, left to right, first A, then B, then C, to get a three-digit number. After the case statement, I uh, simply write down the numbers I have. One more thing to note in Verilog is how we describe numbers. Unlike in the C programming language, where we normally don't worry about the size of numbers, although you should, because you do need to worry about overflow and underflow for floating point numbers. But when you're describing digital hardware, you really need to pay attention to how many bits there are in a number. And because I've combined three one-bit numbers, I get a three-bit number. So I write three prime B. That denotes a 3-bit binary number, B for binary, 0, 0, 0. And so this will, this part of the case statement will get executed if A is 0, B is 0, and C is 0. In this case, I want to set uh, both D and E to 1, because that's what's given in my truth table. Now, there are two ways of doing this. I could do begin d equals 1, or 
if I want to be uh, if I want to avoid any warnings from the compiler if I just write the number one here that will actually translate into a 32-bit number 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 except for a one at the end so ideally I tell it that it's actually a one-bit number here otherwise it's going to have to truncate that 32-bit number to fit into the 1-bit D, and you might get a compiler warning. So I can do that, and then similarly I can do this, and then I can do an end here. And that's fine, it's just a bit of typing. So there's a faster way, and I do that by making the same use of concatenation, and concatenation can be done on either side of the equal statement. So I can replace this with d comma e concatenated together is a two bit number equal to one one. And this is a lot easier for me to type. Now if I were to do this I'm going to find that I'm going to get an, an, an error. And that's because when we define output de that's a shortcut for saying that D and E are wires. In here, inside an always block, I am explicitly doing an equals. This is not an assign. This is an, an equals inside some very log block, in this case, an always statement. I can only assign things to registers, not to wires. So I have to make both D and E registers. So I do that by sticking register up here. The keyword reg here is going to be applied not only to D but also to E as a shortcut here. So register extends not just to D but also to E. So D and D are registers. And now I'm almost done. I just have to fill out the rest of my code. So I go through my truth table and that's the next line. And you might get a bit bored watching here. So let me pause. I've now filled out the body of the case statement and we end the case with end case. And we end our module with end module with a lowercase e, which is hard to do with autocorrect. Now it's very important when you have a case statement that all the cases are listed here. We will explain this in later lectures in more detail, but our outputs D and E, they have to be continuously assigned to something. If we miss a case statement here, then what can happen is that A, B and C change their value, but because we haven't listed a particular entry here, we forgot it. There's no new value assigned to D and E. And that means that D and E has to remember its old value. But combinational logic cannot remember things. And so, to cut a long story short, the circuit is not going to be able to be synthesized correctly. You're going to get strange errors in Quartus about um, not being able to synthesize latches or something. The key point is that we have to cover all cases. Just accept that for now as a golden rule. In more complicated situations, it might be difficult to double check you've assigned everything. So it's very common in other cases to include a default statement. The default statement gets run if no other case statement has matched. Now it turns out that you can put the default statement anywhere you like within the case statement, but by convention, we put it at the end. And so if no other case matches, what should I set D and E equal to? Well, often you set it equal to say all zero if that's a sensible thing to do because often it's an error condition. And this could be another acceptable solution. If we wanted to be clever, and there comes a point when too much cleverness gets you in trouble, so it's maybe not the preferred thing to do. But if we look down and see what's the most common output, 
Well, the most common output seems to be 0, 1. I have a 0, 1 here, a 0, 1 here, and a 0, 1 up here. So I could if I wanted, I'm not recommending this, but I could delete this. That's when I have a 0, 1 coming out. And these two lines, I've got a 0, 1 coming out. And then I change my default to be 0, 1. And this will give me the same behavior. Because if A, B and C are equal to, for example, 0, 0, 1, then it's not going to match anything on the left hand side here so the default statement is going to be executed instead and I'll get the correct 0, 1 coming out. In summary, if we are given a truth table then the easiest, well the most direct way of implementing it in Verilog is using a case statement. We might need to use this concatenation trick because inside the case statement we can only have one variable so to speak. So here we're combining three variables into one. And we can also use the concatenation trick to, to avoid having to write begin and end for each of these individual cases. We must make sure we cover all cases. So it's very common to have a default statement at the end to make sure that we haven't missed anything. And finally, because we're making an assignment inside this always block, then we have to declare D and E as registers. That, that tells Verilog that the values of D and E can be changed through some type of equal sign. A sign is special, any other type of equal signs, and you have to, be a, be, be, you have, to have the left-hand side a register. As an advanced tip, it's mentioned that for the always statement, you don't have to explicitly write A, B, and C here. You can use the wildcard star. And what star does is that it's going to look through everything inside the always statement here. And it's going to work out what variables can affect the outcome. And so Verilog is smart enough to look through here and it, and it sees that, ah, oh, this block in here, it depends on A and B and C. And so therefore this star here is going to be automatically replaced by A and B and C. Basically in this course, you can just always put a star in here. It's almost always what you want to do. A few practice problems will do something different to show you what, what happens. But normally when you write sensible code, you want a star in here.